welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to talk about Hebrew, uh, learning a second language. I want to look at Joseph Smith's interest in Hebrew. There's many uh, different sources that show his interest in Hebrew. I want to talk about the pure Adamic language. And um, we're also going to look at the Hebrew Bible, um, like the Bible in Hebrew, uh, the Old Testament and some interesting things from that, okay? So you might recall in a, in a recent video, I, was, I said, you know, that I should probably learn Hebrew. And then I actually took that seriously yesterday, and uh, that's how I spent all my day yesterday, as I was uh, learning Hebrew, the basics, of course, because I don't, I don't speak it at all, so I'm just a beginner. But I decided that it would be a really good thing to do on Sundays, a good Sunday activity. And um, I want to go through why you would want to do this. First, I want to kind of just talk about learning a second language in general, but then the reasons why you should maybe think about or you should consider learning Hebrew or, or even just a biblical language. So first, when it comes to learning a second language, uh, there's this article here from University of the Potomac, Nine Benefits of Learning a Second Language. Okay, and you may be familiar already with some of these. Number one, it stimulates your brain. Okay, acquiring a new language means that you're going to learn a whole new set of rules of grammar and lexis, uh, whether you find this part amusing or not. While your brain is trying to keep up with the new language's complexities and take in the new patterns, new developments are happening in the brain. Just like muscles, the brain gets stronger and bigger uh, the more you put it to use. Okay, so that's a really good reason to learn a new language. Number two, it improves your attention span, which that is good. I, I feel like this is something that we're suffering from today. I, I really do. Like, like people are having shorter and shorter attention spans, uh, which is annoying uh, because it, it means that like when you want to learn something, if you like want to truly learn something, it normally takes time. And so if you have a bunch of people that can't spend time um, studying something, then they're not going to learn anything. And therefore, uh, what does that equate to? It equates to being dumb, right? If you can't pay attention and you can't take in the necessary information, then uh, you're probably going to end up being dumb. <laughs> so this is great if you need help with that. Uh, and I'm not necessarily calling you dumb, but just like, really, we, we need to have not short attention spans, long attention spans. Number three, more career options to choose from. And uh, I can actually attest to this because, uh, as you know, I went to Spain on my mission, came back, and my first job was at a, a call center. And um, they paid more if you spoke Spanish, so you could like take Spanish calls. And that's what I did. And I got paid more. So um, this is uh, this could be a good reason to do it. Number four, it boosts your creativity. Number five, it improves your first language. I'm sure it does because then you start maybe paying attention more to how you speak and vocabulary and stuff like that. Number six, you build multitasking skills. Okay, now number seven and number eight are probably the, I'd say the three most important ones, at least for me, would be number one, it stimulates your brain, and then number seven and eight, it slows down cognitive decline and it improves your memory. So I'm actually going to read this paragraph for it slows down cognitive decline. If you still haven't started and needed another incentive to start learning a new language, here's one. Learning a language may reduce your chances of getting early onset of cognitive impairments. More than 60 million people in the United States live with cognitive impairment, be it Alzheimer's, dementia, or any other disorder. Now, I, I will say, you guys, um, my great grandpa had Alzheimer's. Uh, I was not old enough to remember him, but I was told plenty of stories. And I do not want to get Alzheimer's. And I also don't want to get dementia because I know that everyone's had contact with somebody that's had dementia. And these are not, this is not something that you want to happen to you. 
Um, I don't know how inevitable those things are, but learning a second language can help. Uh, it says, the latest study on the effect of bilingualism is cognitive aging. Okay, the latest study on the effect of bi bilingualism in cognitive aging found that people who spoke more than one language, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, and occupation experience, the onset of cognitive decline four years and a half later uh, than the ones who spoke only one. So, okay, so it delayed it. It delayed it on average uh, four and a half years. Uh, while knowing a second language is not exactly the fountain of youth, it definitely helps keep your brain younger. And then number eight, it improves your memory. Number nine, it boosts your self-esteem. Okay, so just in general, uh, I would encourage you to learn another language. But let's talk about Hebrew. Why, why would you want to speak Hebrew or learn Hebrew? Um, the obvious, one of the more obvious reasons is because um, there could be spiritual benefits to this, right? Yeah, you could read the original Hebrew when you're reading the Old Testament, for example. Uh, you may gain new insights, which I want to share a few with you uh, toward the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but there's some other reasons, okay? Uh, look at this. Okay, this is from the Jerusalem Post, This Week in History, Revival of the Hebrew Language. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, for me, I didn't really have a very clear idea of the history of Hebrew. I, I knew that Ashkenazi Jews, a lot of them spoke uh, Yiddish. And then um, I guess I pictured the Sephardic Jews speaking just Portuguese and Spanish primarily, but I think I kind of assumed that they did speak Hebrew, uh, although I, I was confused why the Ashkenazi Jews spoke Yiddish. So it turns out that this is a revived language. Okay, I didn't know that until just recently. Uh, and it's, it's credited primarily to this man right here. His last name is Ben Yehuda. Okay, the process, the process of the Hebrew language revival began on October 13th, 1881. 1881. So this was after Joseph Smith. Uh, this was after the saints had arrived in Utah, uh, but before Utah had become a state. Utah became a state in 1896. So it was still the territory of Utah. And I, I will point out uh, we've talked about this a number of times, and you've probably heard it elsewhere within the church. It's, it's interesting how many things have happened since the 1800s. Um, you know, obviously, just like all the innovation, all the technology that we've had uh, since that time, which has facilitated the spread of the gospel and the church. But also, if you look at it uh, from this point of view, you know, it the 1800s, uh, and probably specifically Joseph Smith sending Orson Hyde to uh, Jerusalem to dedicate the land for the gathering of the Jews, that probably had, um, that probably really helped this process out. Uh, you know, as far as like not only bringing the Jews back to their land, uh, but also reviving the language that they used to speak. Right, and, and we're going to talk about Aramaic and stuff like that. I know that they spoke Aramaic, but uh, before that, it was Hebrew. Okay, so anyway, there's an actual date when this process began, October thirteenth, eighteen eighty-one. That is pretty recent. Uh, as Eliezer, Eliezer ben Yehuda and his friends agreed to exclusively speak Hebrew in their conversations. <laughs> So that's how, that's how it started. A group of friends deciding to exclusively speak Hebrew in their conversations. Could you imagine doing that? Uh, that would be kind of hard, I would think. <clears throat> I would think that because when I was on my mission, it was hard for me to, you know, one of the mission roles was to speak Spanish when we were outside of the apartment. Um, but, okay, full, full disclosure, hardly anybody did that. Because it's more comfortable to tell stories 
in your own language. Like when you're walking on the streets and you want to like talk about things, you feel very limited by the new language because you don't speak it that well. And so you can't, um, you can't um, uh, say everything that you want to say in detail. So anyway, so I would imagine that doing this would be kind of hard. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, as a result, the language, which had not been spoken as a mother tongue since the second century AD, okay, the 100s, once again became the national language of Israel. So th this is the time of the when the Romans destroyed uh, Israel or destroyed Jerusalem. Okay, since that time, it had not been spoken as a native language. Okay, some 3,000 years earlier, when the Jewish people first arrived in, the, in Israel with Joshua, Hebrew was established as the national language and lasted for more than a millennium until the Bar Kokhba War in 135 AD, or Common Era. From that point on, Hebrew was exclusively used for literature and prayer until late in the 19th century with the first Aliyah, uh, which is immigration in Hebrew, the first Aliyah uh, and, and Ben Yehuda. So you, I guess you can kind of look at it. So from the time of the Romans until the 1800s, uh, the same way that Latin was to the Catholic Church, you know how the Catholic Church used to do mass, uh, in Latin, in uh, you know the scriptures were in Latin, uh, but it, it was a dead language. It wasn't spoken by really the congregation or or the country <coughs> where the, the Catholic Church would have been for any given you know diocese or whatever. So as Latin was to Catholicism, Hebrew was to Judaism <clears throat> during this period. With Catholicism, they finally did away with that practice. I think it was with Vatican II in the 1960s where they, there were like a lot of reforms. But that's how it used to be. It's like everything was done in Latin. So anyway, born in 1858, Ben Yehuda grew up in Belarus, formerly part of the Russian Empire, where he started studying the Bible. At the age of three, he started learning uh, in a cheddar, a yeshiva for young children. Uh, yeshiva, by the way, that's where you go to like study Torah, Talmud, and Mishnah and stuff like that, uh, where he learned ancient Hebrew. By the time he was 12, Ben Yehuda was familiar with large, with large portions of Torah, Mishnah, and Talmud. Hoping he would become a rabbi, his parents sent him to a yeshiva where he continued studying Torah and ancient Hebrew. With the rise of Jewish nationalism in 19th century Europe, Ben Yehuda was captivated by the innovative ideas of Zionism. Again, interesting that in the 1800s, there's this renewed interest in creating um, a Jewish state, right? That's what Zionism is all about, creating a Jewish state. Uh, and along with that, you know, in this case, the, the language itself, this stuff happening in the 1800s. I don't think that's coincidence. Um, Okay, while reading the Hebrew language newspaper Hashahar, he became acquainted with Zionism and concluded that the reviving <clears throat> that the reviving the the Hebrew language in the land of Israel would unite all Jews worldwide. And so, in 1881, Ben Yehuda made Aliyah and came to live in Jerusalem. At that time, it was believed that one of the criteria needed to define a nation worthy of national rights. Uh, was its use of a common language spoken both by both the society and the individual. In fact, Ben Yehuda regarded Hebrew and Zionism as one in the same, writing that, quote, the Hebrew language can live only if we revive the nation and return it to the fatherland. According to researchers, it appears that in the 50 years preceding the start of the revival process, a version of spoken Hebrew already existed in markets of Jerusalem. The Sephardic Jews who spoke Ladino or Arabic and Ashkenazi Jews who spoke Yiddish needed a common language for commercial purposes. And the most obvious choice was Hebrew. 
It should be noted that it was not a native mother tongue as such, but more of a pigeon. Uh, so a pigeon, that's where, and I came across this on my mission. There were a lot of Africans there. Um, and we, we, we actually taught a lot of Nigerians, um, Ghanaians. And so basically you have these countries like Ghana, Nigeria, that uh, you have like all these different tribal languages, but then they use English as like a way to communicate between each other. And um, some speak, some people speak it really well. Others, they only use it as a pidgin language, meaning um, like a bare bones English, right? Uh, just enough to communicate uh, for practical matters, you know, uh, but nothing more. So that's how it was being used, according to this, between the Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews. Okay. So this is one reason to think about learning Hebrew, because you can play a part in history by helping to revive it, right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen uh, in the millennium, most likely, I, I would imagine that the pure Adamic language would be restored, I, I would imagine. But in the initial portions of the millennium, okay, we know that things aren't just going to like happen all of a sudden. Like every, the, everything's going to change. Uh, we're still going to have, again, we're going to have the different religions at the beginning of the millennium. It's not going to be until time goes by. Uh, that the first generations of the millennium either convert or pass away, and then everyone will be members of the true church. So in the first part, there's, you know, because Christ is going to come, he's going to institute his kingdom. And uh, there's going to be the two world capitals, old Jerusalem and new Jerusalem. And so you can imagine there's probably going to be a need to communicate uh, with them you know, because essentially what you're going to have is the northern kingdom uh, primarily in the Americas <coughs> and then the southern kingdom, Judah, in Jerusalem. I'm sure there'll be tribes, people from all tribes in both places, you know, because like it's not like you have to live there, but uh, where you're you can live wherever you want. But, you know, we've talked about on the channel how English that's probably one reason why English has become so widespread is the Lord probably helped English um, grow so big. And uh, it, it's become so big and important that uh, the majority of Jews speak English. I mean, half of them worldwide are here in the United States. And uh, roughly the other half is in Israel. And then you have like you have you know smaller populations in other countries, but the two main halves are in the United States and Israel. And English is widely spoken in Israel. It's mandatory in school. So English um, is probably going to play a big role. But who knows how? If you learn Hebrew, that may play a role as well. It may facilitate things in some way. You you never know. Uh, and, what, and that's just talking about the millennium. Before the second coming happens, you may be able to do some good by knowing Hebrew. You know, maybe you'll go to Israel and you'll be able to get around and speak Hebrew and, you know, maybe build some more bridges. You never know. Okay, so that, that's one reason why you might consider it. Um, let me read just a little bit about the Adamic language before we continue with Hebrew. So th this is one thing that's unique to our church is that we believe that there was a pure Adamic language. Um, so in Judaism, they, they would say that Hebrew is the, the pure language from all the way back to Adam. But let me just read this. This is from BYU. Uh, this is not Wikipedia, despite how it looks. This is by John S. Robertson. He says, the concept of the Adamic language grew among Latter-day Saints out of statements from scripture, comments of early church leaders, and subsequent tradition. It does not play a central doctrinal role, and there is no official church position delineating its nature or status. The scriptures state that this language, written and spoken by Adam and his children, was pure and undefiled. 
which is interesting because Moses is the one credited with the five books of Moses, the Torah, right? The first five books of the, of the Old Testament, um, which originally was in Hebrew. But here we have this book of Moses within our church, and it's talking about this concept of a pure and undefiled language. The implication being that Hebrew is not pure and undefiled. Uh, Brigham Young taught that it continued from Adam to Babel, at which time the Lord caused the people to forget their own mother tongue, scattering them abroad upon the face of the whole earth, except possibly for Jared and his family in the Book of Mormon. Um, I'm going to go over to this timeline of the Old Testament. It's interesting because um, presumably... Presumably, we don't, I guess we don't know for sure, but before the le, before the flood, most likely everyone was speaking the same Adamic language. Maybe maybe there, enough time had gone by to maybe there were some different dialects or possibly other languages. I don't know, but um, the flood happens, and then the people that remain in the old world, you know, Abraham, his descendants, and then everybody else, all their languages all get. Um, there, there's all these different languages. They lose the original language. But Jared, again, presumably, um, well, it seems, according to scripture, according to Ether, maintains their language. And then they go back to where Adam dwelt and Seth and Jared. They go back to the, uh, to the Americas, where the Adamic language was being spoken, and they continue to speak the Adamic language. So isn't that kind of, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, when it comes to like the story of languages, uh, the old world, everyone gets scattered. There's all these different languages. In the new world, or really the real old world, the Americas, uh, it continues to have the Adamic language spoken. That, that's just an interesting thing. Um, I've always kind of been interested in Jared and his people because these are not people that descend through Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, right? But the Lord was still with them. They had prophets, and um, it just, the nature of the church, right, the faith, whatever you want to call it, before Abraham, it's an interesting thing to think about, because usually when we think about the scriptures, and we think about covenants and stuff like that where we usually think about this part of the story over here abraham and afterwards but there was a whole period of time before abraham you know we had melchizedek that was a high priest abraham went and paid him tithes and uh we've gone over articles um one specifically in the enzyme where there's a lot to suggest that shem and melchizedek may actually be the same person they may be the same person uh, we don't know that for sure, but um, anyway, there was some kind of organization uh, before the time of Abraham. So, okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> um, this statement reflects the widely held Mormon belief that the founding members of the Jaredite civilization preserved the Adamic language at their immigration to the New World. Thus, the description by the brother of Jared of his apocalyptic vision was rendered linguistically inaccessible without divine interpretive help, since, quote, the language which ye shall write, I, God, have confounded. In the early years of the church, some words of the Adamic language may have been revealed to Joseph Smith. Uh, see Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, uh, page 342. And other early church leaders, including Brigham Young, and Elizabeth Ann Whitney, who were said to have spoken it in tongues, which is kind of interesting. Um, when it comes to speaking in tongues, you know, we know that there's the gift of tongues. It's like a spiritual gift, and uh, it's primarily, I think, used for missionary work uh, to help missionaries learn a new language. The speaking in tongues, like in the, like I, whenever I hear that, I think about like the Pentecostals because I think they're really big on the whole like, you know, getting 
religiously, spiritually excited, and then speaking in another language, you know, speaking in tongues. I think that that has, like, happened in the church. Um, in fact, I think it happened at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Uh, although I don't really understand w what the reason would be for that. Because, um, like, who are you communicating with? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a type of thing where like maybe the veil is kind of withdrawn from your mind and you're remem you're remembering the pure language or something like that. I, I don't know. If you if you know more about that, feel free to put it down in the comments. But anyway, uh, more recently, President Ezra Taft Benson alluded to its possible universal reinstatement to resolve linguistic diversity. And of course, that would probably happen during the millennium. I, I'm sure, I, I have no doubt that that's going to happen. It just makes sense. I don't think that we would continue speaking English um, or even Hebrew. It would be interesting to see how close Hebrew is to the original Adamic language because they may be pretty related, um, but we don't know for sure. Uh, similarly, Zephaniah 3.9, possibly referring to the future of the Adamic language, says, quote, I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may call upon the name of the Lord. The word pure comes from the Hebrew berua, from barar, to cleanse or purify, also to choose. Because it is generally held that a language reflects its culture, Possibly the erosion of the purity of the Adamic culture after Babylon led to the uh, concomitant, okay, concomitant loss. I hate, I hate rare, very little words like this that aren't used very much. I hate it. I hate it. I, I can't. That's why I don't like English, frankly. If we're going to be frank, I do not like English. Look at this word. Future. Why does there need to be an E at the end? Why? Why does call have to have two L's? Why? It doesn't make any sense. And, that, you know, with English, you can go on and on and on with it. You think of words like though or through. You know, you have the G-H at the end. It's, just, it's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. Every single idea, every noun, verb, uh, object, whatever, there should be a unique word for each one of those, rather than words that, you know, you have one word which can mean different things. Um, it's just, it's so silly. It's so silly. <sighs> anyway, uh, loss of purity of expression in its mirroring language. Okay, yeah. Here's um, Joseph Smith papers. Here's just like a little example of it. Uh, so this is, okay, a sample of pure language given by Joseph the Seer as copied by B.R. Johnson. Question, what is the name of God in pure language? Answer, Amen. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of this, but, you know, that's why Adam Andai Amen is called what it is. Um, it's it's supposed to be the pure Adamic language. Adam, Andai, Amen. Okay, so here it is in the Joseph Smith papers. Um, when it comes to Hebrew, okay, this is from my Jewish learning. It says, within biblical Hebrew itself, subdivisions can be made according to the period or stage of the language. The earliest Hebrew texts that have reached us date from the end of the second millennium BCE or uh, BC. The Israelite tribes that settled in Canaan from the 14th to 13th centuries BCE, regardless of what their language might have been before they established them themselves there, used Hebrew as a spoken and literary language until the fall of Jerusalem in 570, 587 BCE. Okay, so that, that's just basically saying from the time the tribes entered Canaan, right, with Joshua, Hebrew was the language from then until the Babylonian conquest. So it's saying here we don't know what they spoke before that. And I, this 
seems to be talking from like a scholarly point of view because if it was religious if this was like a purely jewish point of view they would probably say that it's been spoke been spoken from the beginning uh i think that's why what, what i heard before is that's what they believe anyway uh, what we know as Biblical Hebrew is without doubt basically a literary language, which until the Babylonian exile ex existed alongside living spoken dialects. Now, the exile marks the disappearance of this language from everyday life and its subsequent use for literary and lit litur liturgical, liturgical purposes only during the Second Temple period. Um, 515 BCE to 70 CE. So 515 BC to 70 AD. Okay, and, and we know that during that time, that's when Aramaic was being spoken. And we're going to talk a little bit about Aramaic. It is often it has often been stated that biblical Hebrew is not a language in the full sense of the word, but merely a uh, quote fragment of language, only a part of the language actually used by the Israelites prior to the exile. This is without doubt one of the most serious limitations for an adequate study of its history. Ten centuries ago, the, Spains of, the Jews of Spain were fully conscious of this, as demonstrated by the words of some Cordoban, Cordoban scholars, quote, had we not left our country as exiles, we should today p possess the whole of our language as in former times. So whatever they were speaking uh, originally before the Babylonian conquest, a lot of that had been lost. Okay, uh, The approximately 8,000 lexical items preserved in the books of the Bible would not have been enough to meet the needs of a, li of a living language. Okay. The origins of Hebrew. The historical problem of the origins of Hebrew, sometimes raised as a question of the, of the kind, uh, quote, what was the language spoken by the patriarchs, or what was the language of the conquerors of Canaan, is beyond the scope of this study, which is concerned only with more narrowly linguistic issues. Whatever the truth of the matter, we do not recognize, we have to recognize that the exact beginnings of Hebrew, of the Hebrew language, are still surrounded by mystery. So they don't really know. Uh, from the moment of its appearance in a document, in a, in a documented written form, Hebrew offers clear evidence that it belongs to the Canaanite group of languages with certain peculiarities of its own. In the passage where Jacob and his descendants are betrayed as, as making a final break from Laban, uh, the Aramean, <clears throat> Genesis thirty-one forty-seven, various writers have seen an allusion to the time when the Israelite, Israelites abandoned Aramaic and adopted the Canaanite language of the country they were living in. So it's basically saying that, because um, you know this story, right? Israel and Laban. Israel went to go work for Laban, uh, for Rachel, and then you know that story. So Laban, it says here, was an Aramean, so I guess he was speaking Aramaic, but Jacob, upon coming back to Canaan afterwards, uh, would have spoken the language that they were speaking there, Hebrew. Um... I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, I thought I was going to, but I won't. Uh, but the Bible dictionary talks about both Hebrew and Aramaic, and it basically just talks about how um, Abraham was probably the first one to, to start speaking it. Uh, it says here, it was probably learned by Abraham after his settlement in Canaan and adopted by him in place of Aramaic, of the Aramaic of his earlier years. Okay. And then Aramaic, it's a similar language to Hebrew. Um, in fact, in one of these articles here, it was saying that it was like a dialect. So 
Anyway, Arama Aramaic language, Semitic language of the northern, central, or northwestern group that was originally spoken by the ancient Middle Eastern people known as Arameans. It was most closely related to Hebrew, Syriac, and Phoenician, and was written in a script derived from the Phoenician alphabet. And here's like a little tree, a little diagram showing you right here. Let me see if I can blow this up. Right here you have modern Hebrew, okay? Um, and then you go up here. So basically these are the Semitic languages, right? East, West, so Hebrew would be part of West, and then you come down here, you have Arabic, which I guess they don't know if it comes directly from that or from Central, but anyway, you have Arabic and then Ethiopic, other Arabian languages, and then Northwest Semitic, uh, which is where you get Hebrew. It descends through this line right here, okay? Um, let's see. As I was like studying this a little bit more, now you know that during the time of the New Testament, that's what they were speaking. They were speaking Aramaic. Okay, Christ did not speak Hebrew. He was speaking Aramaic. And on this uh, website here, Aramaic Rocks, Aramaic dot rocks, it says. Uh, Aramaic, Aramaic and Hebrew are very closely related Semitic languages, like, say, Italian and Spanish, sh sharing a lot of common vocabulary and grammar. Um, if you went on a Spanish-speaking mission or if you're a native Spanish speaker, then you know that when you listen to other Romance languages like French, um, Romanian, uh, Portuguese, Italian, you can kind of like pick up on what they're saying, you know. Uh, I, I would say for me, it's easiest to understand Italian when I'm like watching TV and Italian's being spoken. Um, I can kind of understand it a little bit. So I guess uh, for those of you that would understand that, I guess that's kind of like the difference between Hebrew and Aramaic, okay? Now, let's get into Joseph Smith's emphasis on well, his interest and emphasis on Hebrew, okay? This is another reason why it might be a good idea to learn Hebrew if you're going to learn, learn another language. This is excerpts from a proclamation of the first presidency to the saints scattered abroad. And this is how it starts out. Well, I think this says excerpts, but it says here, the name of our city, Nauvoo, is of Hebrew origin and signifies a beautiful situation or place, carrying with it also the idea of rest and is truly descriptive of the most delightful location. We went over that in that other video, but it's interesting that the headquarters of the church at that time was named after a Hebrew word or, or at least Hebrew in origin. It's derived from Hebrew and I, and I already covered that. So, so you have that. I basically just typed in Hebrew um, in the scripture citation index and I searched teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith to see all the different times that he spoke about it. So that's what I'm sharing with you here. Okay, exceptions to Bible translations. So these are all by Joseph Smith, okay? I am now going to take exceptions to the present translation of the Bible in relation to these matters. Our latitude and longitude can be determined in the original Hebrew with far greater accuracy than in the English version. Okay, Joseph Smith is saying that you can get a much better idea of what's being said or communicated in the Hebrew rather than the English of the Bible. Uh, of course, talking about the Old Testament. I, I can't remember, I know the New Testament, you know, you have the Greek, there might be some Hebrew, I, I cannot remember. But anyway, okay, continuing. Uh, there is a grand distinction between the actual meaning of the prophets and the present translation. Okay. Can you imagine just, I have it pulled up here. We're going to go through some of this. 
can you imagine reading the pure like what even though there still could be um things taken out or not correctly written down um this is about this is probably about as good as it gets going to the original hebrew could you imagine reading the bible in hebrew and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you an example of something that is really interesting. You may already know about it. It's not really going to be um, that big of a thing, but I'll show you something. Okay, the prophets. Okay, the prophets do not declare that they saw a beast or beasts, but that they saw the image or figure of a beast. Daniel did not see an actual bear or lion but the images or figures of those beasts. The translation should have been rendered image instead of beast in every instance where beasts are mentioned by the prophets. But John saw the actual, but John in the book of Revelation, but John saw the actual beast in heaven. Okay, so in, we've actually, I think, covered this before in, an, in another video. <laughs> Go see my playlist called uh, Revelation or the book of Revelation. Okay. World of Spirits. It says Hades, Hades, the Greek, or Sheol, the Hebrew. These two significations mean a world of spirits. Hades, Sheol, paradise, spirits in prison are all one. It is a world of spirits. Um, can't remember if there was anything else here. No. So he's referring to the Hebrew word for that, right? Sheol. All right. Meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. I shall comment on the very first Hebrew word in the Bible. I will make it a, co a comment on the very first sentence of the history of the creation of the Bible. Bereshit. Okay, I'm actually going to pull that up. You can see right here, Bereshit, and it's this word right here. Okay, now, when you're learning Hebrew, you will most likely need the guide of these dots right here. So what's happening here is that Hebrew, it like... The characters, most of them are consonants. Some of them are vowels. It, it's kind of, I'm still trying to understand this. Some of them do make vowel sounds, but I think they're referred to as consonants. So what they do is that when they write words, they leave out the vowels. Okay. So um, if you're like learning Hebrew, they have like this dot system, or if you're le reading like uh, religious texts like this, um, I don't know if they do this for children. They probably do this for children that are starting to learn to read and write. Um, they have this, but over time, once you become familiar with the language, you no longer need this. You just know what the word is supposed to sound like, looking at only the consonants. So. This right here, this, this, uh, this is bet, and when it has a dot right here, it makes a b sound instead of a v sound. This is resh, or I'm still working on my r's, resh, um, which is an r sound. So when there's a dot right here, it means that there's a e afterward. Okay, so be, be, re, and. Don't, I'm not going to explain all this. You'll just have to <laughs> have to like study it on your own. But Bereshit. This this is the yod it makes a like a y sound e, right? Bereshit. So, um, yeah. So there there's an example of that. That's what <clears throat> Joseph Smith is talking about. This very first word, Bereshit. Okay. Um, I will make a comment on the very first sentence of the history of the creation in the Bible, Bereshit. I want to analyze the word. 
byte, in, by, through, and everything else. Roche, or Roche, the head, sheet, grammatical, grammatical termination. When the inspired man wrote it, he did not put the byte there. Um, and an old Jew, without any authority, added the word. He thought it too bad to begin to talk about the head. It reads, quote, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods. Um, that is the true meaning of the words. Barao signifies to bring forth. If you do not believe it, you do not believe <coughs> the learned man of God. Learned men can teach you no more than what I have told you. Thus, the head of God brought forth the gods in the Grand Council. Now, this is something, before I read this, okay, before I read this, you, you've heard of the word Elohim, right? That's like one of the, the names of God, Elohim. And if you know Hebrew, you know that anything that ends in I am, like in English, I am, im, is plural. So when you read Elohim, it's like saying gods, gods, right? That's, that, that's what is written in the original Hebrew. In English, okay, do I have this pulled up? Let me pull it up on the lds.org, libraries, scriptures, Old Testament, Genesis, chapter 1. So in the King James Version, let me scroll in or zoom in, it says, in the beginning, God singular, created the heaven and the earth, right? But when you read the Hebrew, it says, it's this word right here, Ech lo -him. Elohim, I shouldn't do right here, it's huh. Elohim. Um, this right here, here's the Yod, which makes the E sound, and the Mem, that makes the M sound, Im. Okay, so this says gods. This says <clears throat> gods, plural. So, knowing that I'm not the first one ever to see this, neither was Joseph Smith, obviously the Jews know that it says gods, plural, but Judaism is known for being a monotheistic religion, one of the, the great monotheistic religion that teaches there's only one God. So if that's what they teach, then why does it say gods, plural, here? I wanted to see what, what their explanation was for that. Um, this is what I found. Uh, this is a Messianic uh, Jewish website, Promises to Israel. And this is what they say. Um, I guess that there's three arguments, okay? The first one is heavenly court. The first line of argument is reflected by the following comments in the Jewish interpretation of the plural personal pronoun us in the Tanakh. The biblical scholar and author Nahum Sarna refers to Elohim and the pronoun us by saying, quote, this is an Israelite version of the poly polytheistic assemblies of the pantheon monotheized and depaganized. Sarna gives his resistance to the plural personal pronouns by noting, quote, Elohim is a comprehensive term for supernatural beings and is often employed for angels, end quote. He asserts that in Genesis 35, 7, angels are seen as divine beings. Uh, there is another Jewish response by Israel Wolf Slotke in the Sun. Sonsino series, whose sources of authority are rabbis Abraham Ibn Ezra, Ezra and David Kimchi. Slot, Slotkey states that the us of Isaiah 6, 8 represents the angelic host. According to the famous medieval rabbi Rashi, God was being polite or showing good manners and humility by asking permission of the lower beings, angels, 
to create man in their image. Which isn't too far off, but what they, they wouldn't view um, angels as being the same species as humans, right? And what we know from modern revelation is, yeah, he was in fact speaking to, you know, the pre-mortal angels. He was speaking to us. He was speaking to those that were involved in creating the earth. Uh, he was talking to the council, right? So, well, okay, let's read a few more. So that's one argument is that God is speaking to the heavenly court, the angels with him. Um, <clears throat> you know, we the gods with him being, you know, the main God. Uh, oh, I guess there's more that's part of this section. Okay. Rashi, Rashi's sole statement is an assumption that he makes with absolutely no precedent in the Tanakh of Elohim, showing humbleness by consulting with lesser angels before he created man. Bishop Herbert E. Ryle adds this statement in connection to Genesis 1.26. In the thought of the devout Israelite, God was one, but not isolated. He was surrounded by the heavenly host, uh, attended by the seraphim, holding his court with, quote, the sons of God. Among Christian scholars, the Canadian-American theologian Victor P. Hamilton replicates the Jewish argument that the pantheon of gods was replaced by the heavenly court concept. In the biblical adaptation of the story, the pantheon concept was replaced by the heavenly court concept. Thus, it is not other gods, but to the angelic host, the quote-unquote sons of God that God speaks. Okay. The second argument, the plural of majesty. The second line of argument is the view of plural of majesty. This argument given by both Jewish and Christian scholars contend that God was speaking as a Western monarch, as the Queen of England, for example, would speak to her subjects. In speaking of Genesis 3.22, the Haftorah refers to the us as a plural of majesty. And as a consequence of the fall, man became, quote, as one of the angels or us, in a plural of majesty. Rabbi Hertz, editor of the Haftorah, follows the logic to its natural conclusion. Man is become as God, omniscient. Man, having, having through disobedience, uh, secured the faculty of unlimited knowledge, there was real danger that his knowledge would outstrip his sense of obedience to divine law. The interpretation of us as a plural of majesty puts Elohim in the same class of beings that are ministering spirits, angels, to man. The rabbis say that Elohim is speaking like a Western monarch who uses the royal we. Okay, so, uh, and then the third, <coughs> then plural, uh, deliberation, <laughs> deliberation. The third line of reasoning is that is the argument of plural deliberation, meaning the speaker is conferring or consulting with himself, which that's that's the same idea or the same concept as, you know, if if the Trinity is one God, then why, it's just a weird concept that Christ uh, being here would be praying to himself whenever he prays in the New Testament, which, I know that that logic says, well, he's doing it to be like an example to show us how to do it. And, you know, so there, there's that too. So, um, yeah, if you didn't know anything at all, if you didn't have a religion, um, uh, you were just like completely new to Judaism, Christianity, and you read this. Uh, you would probably read it j just like how it reads, that there were gods. Gods created, created the heaven and the earth. So, eh, see? So, uh, this is just one of the few things, and who knows what else there is uh, out there, that as you're reading through the original Hebrew, it may become more clear to you uh, now, this is how it 
uh, this is what we find. I think it's in Abraham, the Abraham account of uh, Genesis. Let me just look it up really quick. When I read this the first time, I was like, what? No. This is like when I was really young. It just sounded weird to me. Um, let's see. The gods plan the creation of the earth. And then the Lord said, let us go down. And they went down at the beginning and they, that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. And they, the gods said, see, so if you're like, oh, this is like a weird thing, like uh, this is just Joseph Smith, you know, making up, just redoing the Genesis story and inserting gods, you know, because that's, I think that's something that upsets Christians or anything. They're like, no, well, that, that's literally, that is literally what it says in the original Hebrew. It's right, it's right here. Elohim, sorry, Elohim, Elohim, right here. This is it. So, again, another good reason to possibly to possibly uh, learn Hebrew. Um, I will transpose and simplify it in the English language. O ye lawyers, ye doctors, and ye priests who have persecuted me, I want to let you know that the Holy Ghost knows something as well as you do. The head God called together the gods and sat in grand council to bring forth the world. The grand counselor sat at the head in yonder heavens and contemplated the creation of the worlds, which were created at the time. When I say doctors and lawyers, I mean the doctors and lawyers of the scriptures. Uh, I have done so hitherto without explanation to let the lawyers flutter and everybody laugh at them. Some learned doctors might take a notion to say the scriptures say thus and so, and we might believe the scriptures. They are not to be altered, but I am going to show you an error in them. Um, and then he, you know, he goes on. He goes on talking about, um, oh yeah, there, there was an interesting, interesting thing here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how can you? Okay, da, da, da. Uh, the Latin says Jacobus, which means Jacob. The Hebrew says Jacob. The Greek says Jacob, and the German says Jacob. Here we have the testimony of four against one. Yeah, because. The other one up here, it says James. Uh, I have an old edition of, okay. I should have just read this. I have an old edition of the New Testament in the Latin, Hebrew, German, and Greek languages. I've been reading the German and find it to be the most nearly correct translation uh, to correspond nearest to the revelations which God has given me for the last 14 years. It tells about Jacobus, the son of Zebedee, it means Jacob. In the English New Testament, it is translated James. So, <laughs> you see, it's just, uh, I just, I, I don't, I don't like it, you know. Um, scriptural interpretation. Okay, here's the next one. Some say I do not interpret the scripture the same as they do. They say it means the heathen gods. Paul says there are gods many and lords many, and that makes a plurality of gods in spite of the whims of all men. Without a revelation, I'm not going to give them the knowledge of the God of heaven. Um, I, will show I will show from the Hebrew Bible that I am correct, and the first word shows a plurality of gods. And I want the apostates and learned men to come here and prove to the contrary if they can. An unlearned boy must give you a little Hebrew. Bereshit barao Elohim ait ashamayin. Okay, whatever. So there's that. There was something else here. Sorry, give me just a second. I'm kind of all over the place on this one. And 
I know someone's going to be like, you could have communicated the same thing in 10 minutes. Uh, you should have blew You know what? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. This is how I do my channel. Um, if you don't like it, make your own channel. <sighs> anyway, I thought I saw something, but whatever. Um, okay, that that's pretty much going to be it. So, um, I would encourage you, you know, uh, learn Hebrew. Even if you already speak a couple languages, maybe add this one to the languages that you know. Maybe learn Greek. Uh, maybe learn Latin, you know. Um, just go with what the Spirit tells you. But, you know, this is, this is a good thing to do, I think, on Sundays. It's a good Sunday activity is spend some time learning another language so that you can uh, more deeply connect with the scriptures. I would really, really like someday to be able just to go through here and just read it. Just read it for myself, right? Because even here, look at this. Even here in this translation, it says, when God began to create heaven and earth. It omits the gods, the Elohim. Okay, this is the uh, the contemporary Torah, JPS 2006. Uh, so this is that's referring to the English uh, translation of the Hebrew. So even here, they don't put what it actually says. So it, it's like it's like the old phrase, you know, if you want it if you want it to be done right, you have to do it yourself. I, I really think that's what you have to do a lot of times. Um, just in life, but also with um, your gospel study. Not saying that you come up with your own theories, you go against the prophets, but you study things yourself deeply. You read things like the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. You read the scriptures. Uh, you do deep dives yourself. Uh, maybe you come to this point where you learn Hebrew, and then you come across this kind of stuff. Okay. If you want it to be done right, your gospel study, you have to do it yourself. And, you know, the general authorities have said that, that we, we need to, um, you know, <clears throat> we, <laughs> I don't know why I'm struggling today with words. I'm, I'm having some kind of, well, I know why, because I was, I woke up just a little while ago and it was, it was early, so I'm not really thinking too clearly. But um, th they have counseled us to, to do the work, you know, do our own study. They're not necessarily going to teach us everything. It's on you uh, to learn as much as you can in this life. So now if you're looking for some tools of how to learn Hebrew, um, there's Duolingo, which you can get for your smartphone. Looks like they probably have a desktop version too. Uh, with this, they have a bunch of different languages, so this is not just Hebrew. And I feel like it's actually been pretty good. It's free. Um, the only problem with it is that you can't... Okay, so like if you make mistakes, then... It's like a, a game where you have so many diamonds, and then when you run out of diamonds, then you have to wait for the next day to get more diamonds to continue your your lessons. Or you can buy diamonds so that you can continue. So it's, you know, a thing like that. I've also been watching this YouTube channel called Learn Hebrew with HebrewPod101.com. And uh, I've learned a lot of things here. Uh, they go over a lot here. They do have a website. As you can see here, it's uh, get 29% off if you da 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 as low as $2.84 a month. $2 um, but there is a lot of, inf of information just here on their YouTube channel and it's current. In fact, look, they just posted this one seven hours ago. Oh, look, six ways to learn Hebrew at home. Heck yeah. I need to check out this video, but they have a lot of videos and, um, you can come to the playlists here. There's a bunch of playlists. 
So you'll just have to kind of like, um, you know, figure out your own way how you want to do it. If you have a budget, then there's all sorts of there's all sorts of programs out there, different uh, services, courses that you can pay for. Uh, there is a really cool thing. Let's see. I'm going to show it to you right now. Hebrew News. Okay, so there's this website, Hebrew News, and there's this uh, add-on for Chrome called Vision Translate. And what you do is you get that uh, add-on for your browser, and then when you highlight a word like this, it'll tell you what it means in English. See, so that way you can kind of come through here. You can sound things out. Uh, on uh, if you have an Android, uh, Google has Google Translate, and it'll tell you the <coughs> you like type something in in English, and then it'll translate it, and then give you the pronunciation of the Hebrew word. But uh, you can use this add-on and just go to like real world examples of Hebrew. Okay. And then, um, so there's probably a mix of things that you, <laughs> that you can do. I'm going to try and do it uh, for free. And I'm going to do that because I know people that have, you know, learned languages on their own. Uh, for example, on my mission, you know, we were supposed to learn Spanish. That's the language of the mission. But we had this Italian elder and... Um, he the, the vast majority of my mission were people from the United States. So everyone was speaking English. And he learned both Spanish and English at the same time. Um, I was surprised when I first met him because he spoke English like really good. There, there was only a small hint of an accent. Just a small hint of an accent. And then when I found out that he had only learned it on the mission just by speaking to his companions and roommates and stuff like that. I, it just, it blew me away. It blew me away. He was able to do it just by doing that. Uh, I know other people that learn a language just by watching TV or movies. So it's not necessarily the most complicated thing in the world. Uh, I, I, it takes time. I think time is maybe the key component. But if you uh, immerse yourself in the language, and I think that's the best way to do it, uh, then you can learn it. And what I what I mean by immerse is like don't don't try don't like a, approach it from like a like a scientific approach. Like don't try and like learn the rules of grammar and how, and stuff like that verb conjugations just you know because that, that's not what children do children just talk to their parents their family they watch cartoons and then they just pick it up they don't think about oh you're supposed to do this when when there's this and i don't think that we should do that either and that's what i'm what I'm trying to consciously do as I learn Hebrew, because when I learned Spanish, it was taught in that way. You learned, you know, the science of Spanish. Uh, you learned about the, one of the big things is verb conjugations, uh, because, well, I'm not going to go into that, but, um, and I, and I feel like already doing it this other way in a more organic way, I'm picking up Hebrew quicker um one thing to avoid is to try and not directly translate from english to whatever language or from that language to english what you're trying to communicate or understand or learn it's a different language uh, they don't necessarily have the same slang that we do you know, you, you might have certain phrases or slang that you like to use. <coughs> you just have to accept the fact that a lot of times that does not exist in that other language. So you have to act as though 
uh, th this is my philosophy. You have to act as though you are a baby and you're, you, ha you know nothing about English and you are just learning how to get by in the world with this language. And basically have like a solid wall between English and the new language. Because if you, um, if you're doing too much like thinking as you're speaking, it's not going to come out very fluently because basically what's happening is you're making calculations in your mind. You know, you're thinking about little things like, oh, this looks like an M or this. No, just you look at the symbol and from now, from now on, that symbol uh, makes a D sound or a G sound. That is it. it it's not, oh, this is like that. No, no just in the, over time as you practice just like anything else uh, practice makes perfect you know you have to make it part of your you have to make it part of your life you know so anyway that's going to be it for this one um, if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later